Hello, ATS 113 students. This is Dr. John Trogi, and I'm just giving you a relatively short lecture today with regard to forecasting. Uh, you would have possibly thought that all semester long we were talking about forecasting, but actually we don't get to it really to the end of the semester where we start talking about actually all semester long the kinds of things we were learning are the parts of how a meteorologist makes forecasts. Uh, the job of a meteorologist is a complicated job that involves both taking the knowledge that he learns in classes and, as we're going to learn in a little bit, uh, uh, information that he gets from computer programs called models. But let's first talk about how people make forecasts in contrast to how computers, models, make forecasts. Um, if we're talking about forecasts made by people, one source of information, of course, would just be folklore. And this is uh, the kinds of stuff that we talk about, like Groundhog Day or how fuzzy the caterpillars are. Um, there are urban legends and uh, tradi ethnic traditions about all kinds of different things. Uh, my grandmother uh, swears by filling walnut shells with water. She can tell what the weather's going to be like. I don't really understand the method myself. Ye old farmer's almanac. Um, all of these things are crap. None of these things have any real uh, connection, of course, to meteorology. Uh, caterpillars don't have any idea what the weather is going to be. Groundhogs, whistle pigs, none of those things know anything about what the weather is going to be. Um, on the other hand, when people are making forecasts, there are techniques they can use that don't involve the complicated computer models we'll be talking about in the second half of the lecture. One technique would simply be something called persistence. A persistence forecast assumes that the current weather is just going to continue. If the last couple of days have been above normal temperatures, a persistence forecast just says a good guess is that it'll continue to be above normal. If it has been a dry spell, if you're under dry conditions, a good guess is that it'll continue to be dry. Persistence is a surprisingly uh, legitimate way to make forecasts, uh, although you, most of the time you think of this as sort of the, uh, the null hypothesis, the, what you're trying to beat. I mean, you want to do better than persistence when you make your forecast. For that matter, another kind of mindless way of making a forecast would be what we call climatology. In forecasting, when, we, when a person makes a climatology forecast, what they're assuming is that the weather in the near future will be a lot like the mean weather of the last 30 years. Um, if, the, if you're trying to make a forecast of what the weather's going to do next week when it's, uh, let's just say, April 17th, well, one way to make a forecast of what the weather's going to be like on April 17th is to just look back and see what the mean temperatures were on the April 17th of the last 30 years. Um, this is a, not a terrible way to make a forecast because odds are it's only going to be so different from the mean temperature over the last 30 years. Uh, if you're making a forecast for um, the middle of, you know, it's, it's some day in July and you're making a forecast for tomorrow and it's a day in July, um, even if you see some cold front coming, predicting snow and sub-freezing temperatures is, is not a good idea because climatology tells you, you know, that maybe your average high temperature on that day is 85 degrees. It won't be all that different from climatology. Again, though, we don't usually make a climatology forecast like that so much as we work on the assumption we're going to be able to do better than that. If you can't beat the climatology forecast, mm, you're not much of a forecaster. Another type of forecast that people can make is an, what we call an analog forecast. Now, this is an analog as in like the opposite of digital. This is analog in the sense of analogy. When we are making an analog forecast, what you do is you find situations in the past that looked a lot like the current weather does. And then you assume that the weather in the future will look like the weather was after these analogous times. So, for example, uh, let's say today there's a big trough in the central United States and a big jet stream moving across the southeast United States and, I don't know, whatever, a uh, high-pressure system centered over New England or whatever. You look through past times when there was a very similar uh, analogous weather pattern and you see, well, what happened then? Maybe the high-pressure system uh, moved off the coast and the trough disappeared and the flow became more zonal. Well, not a bad forecast is that the same thing will happen again. Um, we don't actually explicitly do analog forecasting day to day, um, although it is sort of p implicitly part of what we're doing because, of course, it's human nature. We use our past experiences to inform us about what the future is going to be like. So, I mean, the meteorologist sitting in his office thinks about times he's seen a similar weather pattern and what played out. Uh, on the other hand, analog, an analog forecasts are very common in, like, climate forecasting. Um, when they make those forecasts of how many hurricanes we're going to see this fall, that's usually largely based on an analog forecast. 
They look at years that looked a lot like the present year. For example, uh, the distribution of warm water in the Atlantic, um, other factors that affect uh, hurricanes, the kind of things you learned back in the previous unit. They find years that look similar, and then they say, well, how many hurricanes happened in those years? That's a type of analog forecast that we actually do all the time in atmospheric sciences. Uh, a lot of climate forecasting or long-range forecasting is analog forecasts. If they're trying to figure out what kind of summer we're going to have, is it going to be warm, is it going to be wet, is it going to be dry, whatever, they look at other years that had, say, a spring that looks like our spring, maybe uh, a spring that was unusually warm and unusually wet in the southeast. Maybe it had a similar situation going on with regard to El Nino or something like that. And then they say, well, what happened... If these years look like our current year, what happened in the following summers? That's an analog forecast, and it's a perfectly legitimate way to make certain kinds of forecasts. Uh, there are a few other examples of this. Uh, we won't get just too bogged down on. For example, there are trend forecasts, where if every day it's been getting a little colder, you just assume that the trend is going to continue and tomorrow will be even colder. Or if every day has been getting a little warmer, you assume that the trend is going to continue. Again, these are fairly primitive types of forecasts. We all work on the assumption that the forecast we're going to produce is going to be better than this. But it is awfully hard to just look at a weather map and figure out what the forecast is going to, what the weather is going to do. Generally speaking, meteorologists rely heavily on forecasts that are made by computers. The correct term for this is numerical weather prediction, or NWP, but Meteorologists always use the word modeling to describe this. A model is a computer program that acts like the real atmosphere. Now, sometimes when we do this in an actual classroom, I bring out like model trains at this time. And there's lots of different kinds of model trains. And they're not real trains. They are models. But they teach us something about real trains. For example, but they aren't real. They aren't real trains. They have simplifications. For example, if I bring out some little model train that is used um, in an engineering lab to test as a simulation to see if like trains can make this curve on a track, well, the train isn't a real train. I mean, not only is it smaller, but it probably doesn't have a real engine. It's probably just running on electricity or batteries or something. It probably doesn't have a real gears and stuff like that that work. It doesn't have real windows or anything like that. But that doesn't mean we can't learn about real trains by using this model train. Now, there are lots of different models out there uh, when we come to trains. For example, my, my two-year-old son loves Thomas the Tank Engine. Well, Thomas the Tank Engine is a pretty primitive model of a train, but you can still learn a lot about trains. Thomas the Tank Engine is made of wood. Thomas doesn't have any windows. Thomas's wheels are made of plastic. Thomas only has four wheels. Um, he doesn't, he's not all that much like a train. On the other hand, in some ways, he is like a train. He runs on tracks. He has hooks that, um, actually magnets, that hook him up to other trains uh, or to other cars. There's lots you can learn about trains by playing with Thomas, even though Thomas isn't very much like a real train at all. So there are simple models, like Thomas the Train, and there are very complicated models, like maybe the ones an engineer would use to study uh, you know, to simulate whether or not a train can make that curve or uh, the, few, you know, the wind drag a train is going to experience on a new design or something like that. Well, in the same way, we have computer programs that we call models, and these models can simulate the, the real behavior, not of a train, but the real behavior of the atmosphere. They know the real physics of how the atmosphere works, and they reproduce that to simulate the way the behavior of the real atmosphere works. That's an important aspect of how this all plays out. Another a way of thinking about these kind of computer models is to think about, say, a racing game on your video game console. The racing game includes a computer model of a car. You probably even get to pick the car or design the car as part of the game. But the, the simulation, the model, knows the real physics that control how the car works. The game wouldn't be any fun if there weren't realistic physics controlling that model. If your model of a car in the game could turn on a dime, drive 10,000 miles per hour, uh, and had a front-mounted bazooka that had infinite amounts of ammunition, the game wouldn't be any fun. It's only because the game has a realistic idea of how real cars work, like in terms of how sharp they can turn, how fast they can go, how often they have to stop for fuel, how often you have to stop to reload the front-mounted bazooka, um, that the game has any fun at all. Um, it's in many ways silly. I mean, it's kind of amazing that people tolerate that in video games, that they have to stop and get gas for the car. I mean, there's no gas and there's no car. The car could really run forever without gas. 
but that wouldn't make it a very fun game. You have to plan ahead as to how you're using this simulated gas. Well, in the same way, a real uh, a model of the atmosphere, it's not the real atmosphere, it's a model, it's a computer program, and it is understanding the real physics behind how computer, uh, how the real atmosphere works. Okay, so let's take just a few minutes here and talk about how these computer simulations of the atmosphere, these models, work. Well, first off, they have to start with good observations of the current weather. If you don't know what the current weather is doing, no matter how good these computer programs are, they have no way of knowing what the weather is going to be doing in the future. Um, a mathematician has a pretty fancy technical term for this. Mathematicians would say that uh, forecasting is an initial value problem. Uh, that means that if you don't know what the, is going on at the present time, there's no way to understand what's going on in the future. That's why we take observations from all around the country. So, like, here's an example. This is a very old map, but it gives you an idea. Here are an example of the, uh, I think these are temperature observations from all over the country. And they have to be given to the model so that the model understands what the weather is doing now and can then apply the physics of the atmosphere to understand what's going to happen in the future. These data that are coming in are scattered somewhat randomly around the country. They happen to be like where airports are and stuff like that. Computers are not good at dealing with data that's just sort of scattered around. They tend to work with data that are in rows and columns, like a spreadsheet. The process of taking the data that is, comes in from all these different sources, like weather stations and radiosons and radar stations and so on, and bringing it together into rows and columns of data, like a spreadsheet, is called assimilation. Assimilation of observations, then, is a complicated process by which those observations are taken and combined into one depiction of what the atmosphere is like. So at any given time, uh, the forecasters are taking in all the observations, all the weather uh, the information that came in from satellites, radar, weather stations, etc., and they are using assimilation software to produce a nice depiction of what the current atmosphere is doing right now. So you get a grid that looks something like what I'm showing here. Now, it might be a little hard on this YouTube video to see that there are like little spots on this map that represent like rows and columns. Then the data are just nicely and evenly distributed. We have like used things like interpolation and so on to change observations that were not really on rows and columns to kind of a nice uniform grid like this. Now we have at every one of these little points on here, we have... Um, at the temperature, the pressure, the wind speed, the humidity, all that kind of good stuff. And from that, we can figure out what the weather's going to do in the future by applying what are known as the seven primitive equations. I'm going to tell you a little secret. In the teacher's edition of your textbook, in the beginning, it talks about the methodology that they use in this course. And behind the scenes, what's really been going on all semester long is what you've really been learning is the seven primitive equations. They don't teach most of them in the form of an equation because some of the seven primitive equations are terribly complicated. But the, in words, what each of these seven equations do is really what's been happening all semester long. That's why we put off forecasting it to the end of the semester because forecasting is in many ways uh, almost a review. Um, so these are going to be a set of equations, the so-called primitive equations, that are going to be describing uh, what the, how the physics of the atmosphere work. You are going to apply these seven primitive equations to each of those grid points to find out what the future holds for each of those points. They are prognostic equations. They tell you how the wind is going to change or how the temperature is going to change. We actually saw all these seven primitive equations, just not necessarily in equation format. For example, three of the seven equations are about forces. Uh, they are about how forces like gravity, pressure gradient force, Coriolis force, centrifugal force, etc., are contributing to the winds at each point. Now, we learned about that kind of in words and drawing vectors and so on in this class, but we could have done it using equations. It just would have been awful and everybody would have dropped. But three of the seven primitive equations are about forces. Another primitive equation is the ideal gas law. In fact, this is the only one, I believe, where we learned about the uh, seven, uh, of the, only one of the seven primitive equations that we learned about actually in equation form, P equals rho RT. It's a very basic equation that relates how temperature, pressure, and density are related in the atmosphere. Another one of the seven primitive equations is called the first law of thermodynamics. Um, this is a very complicated uh, equation that combines all the stuff that we learned in the first unit of the course about heat. It's predicting how the temperature is going to change in terms of things like radiation, conduction, convection, etc. Again, we don't learn the equation in this class because everybody would drop. I mean, the equation takes a piece of paper to write down. Uh, it's huge. But we uh, learned the processes behind it in this class.
another one of the seven primitive equations equations that d govern how a model works is going to be so the so-called continuity equation. Now, we didn't uh, use this word continuity yet in this course, but continuity is all about how rising and sinking motion is associated with convergence and divergence. I mean, goodness, how many times this semester have we you talked about convergence and divergence and talked about how that is related to patterns of rising and sinking motion? Well, it turns out these, these vague ideas that we talked about throughout the course and developed a picture in our mind of how they work, there's actually an equation that does it. It's a, different, it's a partial differential equation. It's a giant mess to work with, but it can be done. Again, computers have no trouble solving such things. It's just hard to teach about them. Uh, another one of the seven primitive equations is about conservation of water. Uh, this is all the kinds of stuff that we did in the second unit in the co of the course about things like condensation, evaporation, the growth of raindrops, etc. There's actually equations, uh, an equation that can summarize all of that stuff. Um, there are actually other ways to break up the seven primitive equations. In some textbooks, they'll talk about one of the equations being about vorticity, but then they only have two equations about forces. There's lots of different ways that this can be partitioned, uh, depending on your... But it always takes seven equations. There's uh, a good theoretical foundation as to why that has to be. So your computer model takes these seven primitive equations and applies them. They're prognostic equations. They forecast what the temper, the what the temperature, the pressure, the winds, the humidity, etc., are going to do at some point in the future. Shockingly, it's not very far in the future. It will be about, oh, I said on here one second. I think more, most models are more like five seconds, something like that. It's not very far into the future how far they forecast. So that you might think, well, what's the point of a forecast for like five seconds in the future? Well, this becomes part of a loop. What you're going to do then is, if we think about what the methodology is going to be for a computer forecast made by a model, we're going to take the current observations and assimilate them into this grid that the model understands with rows and columns of data. And at each of those points, we're going to make we're going to apply the seven equations, and it's going to get you a forecast. But it's not for very far into the future. It's maybe a second or five seconds in the future. That's called a time step. There's one you, you've now made a forecast one time step into the future. Well, it's not very far, but now you have at every grid point in the model, you have a new temperature, a new pressure, a new wind, a new humidity, etc., and you apply the seven primitive equations again. And now you have a forecast of what the model is going, what thinks the weather is going to be like two seconds from now, or two, more accurately, two time steps from now. I mean, if your time step is 10 seconds, then you're 20 seconds into the future. So you just keep repeating this process. You go, it's a loop through these uh, th steps three and four that we see here. It might take thousands of times of repeating those, the application of those seven primitive equations to every grid point in the model. But with time, you can get a forecast for 12 hours, 24 hours, 36 hours, 120 hours, whatever, out into the future. Wow, that's a lot of math. Good thing computers are fast. Um, but uh, there are certain things we can do to make this process work better. Um, or run faster, or give us the information we need and don't waste time on things we don't need. For example, one of the trade-offs that we can do that would make the forecasts, uh, the programs run faster, is to talk about the differences between the resolution of the forecast and the domain of the forecast. Um, when we are making these forecasts, we can decide what part of the world are we making forecasts for. For example, let's say we were making forecasts for the United States here, and I wanted to make a, a fairly detailed forecast of the United States. Again, I'm not sure on YouTube how well this is showing up. You might have to get the PowerPoint of this from the blue from blue line to see what's going on here. But if every little spot on this map right here has a uh, dot, it, it shows where we're making forecasts at each of those grid points there, looks like we're going to have pretty detailed information for all of those regions. But if I back this map up a little bit and show you on a larger scale, each of these little white spots here shows us where that for model was making a forecast. Well, I have a fairly well, I have a fairly high resolution forecast over North America. Out over the rest of the world, there's no grid points at all. The domain of my model is just over North America in this case, not the whole world. So, um, well, what if there's some storm, say, out over China that's going to move over North America in the course of the next few days? Well, this model will have no way to know about that because it doesn't even, I mean, it doesn't have any pressure information or temperature information or wind information over China. So it will get that forecast wrong. There's a trade-off here between the resolution and the domain. I can have a fairly detailed forecast with lots of grid points which is showing all kinds of small-scale weather features over the United States and Canada, but I can't do that over the whole world. It would take forever for this computer program to run. In the same way, let's say I want to include the weather features for all around the world. 
Well, here again, I, I apologize, you may have to get the blue line, uh, go to blue line and get the PowerPoint about this. Um, here I have grid points scattered all over the world. My, this is a global model. There is no part of the world that we don't have forecasts for in this. There's no place that the storm could be forming and we don't see it on, on our model. We have temperature information and pressure information and forecasts for that all over the world. On the other hand, these grid points are very far apart. The resolution of this model is not very good. If I zoom in over the United States here, again, I'm not sure how well this shows up on the YouTube version, but there's only, I think, one or two grid points over the uh, entire state of Nebraska here. We don't have very detailed information about what different parts of the state are doing because we have to have a, a, the grid points farther apart so that there's fewer of them. If we tried to have a high-resolution forecast for the whole world, the it would take a huge computer... Well, it would take longer than 24 hours to make a 24-hour forecast, which has no value at all. So there's sort of a trade-off here. You can either run very high-resolution forecasts for a region, but then you're taking a chance that weather features outside your region are important, or you can run a global forecast for the whole world, but then you're not going to have a lot of details as to, like, what's the difference between the forecast between two places that are fairly close together. It's a trade-off between the resolution and the, and the, uh, and the uh, domain of your model. So what happens on any given day is that a large number of these computer programs called models are run. Some of them are run by government agencies like the National Weather Service. Some of them are, I mean, the National Weather Service alone has several models they can choose from. Uh, some are run by individual forecasters. Some are run by other countries that they share their data with the United States. A large number of these models are run on any given day, and each of them produces a slightly different forecast. Uh, this is why there is some uncertainty in the forecast. We don't all, none of these forecasts are going to be exactly right everywhere. Why is there going to be a difference between the different forecasts that are made by different models? Well, for one thing, all the models have slightly different choices of their resolution. Uh, and depending on how far apart the grid points are and so on, there can be weather features that are missed or weather features that are overrepresented or something like that. There are slightly different domains to the different uh, date models. If, if your model is a limited domain and something that's important to the weather is happening outside of that region, you have no way of knowing about it. Um, the seven primitive equations that we talked about earlier in this presentation are pretty complex and most of the models have to make different kinds of approximations in their solution of the uh, equation. So depending on whatever scientist or group of scientists wrote the model, uh, there can be different approximations made and sometimes those approximations are better assumptions than others. Uh, there can be errors in the model, um, not literally errors, I mean typically not errors as in like a bug, but they just may make different choices. For example, um, any given day, observations come in from all around the world that we assimilate into the model, but some of the observations are wrong. There has to be a quality control that is applied to the data that goes into the model, and that process, you know, is somehow automatically filtering out observations that seem to be wrong. Well, if your model makes, you know, has a slightly different method by which it decides what observations are faulty and removes data that other models keep, well, then you're going to have different forecasts. And so on any given day, there's actually a fair amount of complexity with regard to this forecasting business. Uh, the meteorologists have a large number of models, all telling us typically similar things, but not exactly the same thing. This is actually part of how modern forecasting is done. It's a technique referred to as ensemble forecasting. Ensemble refers to a collection. Um, a lot of TV shows are ensemble programs. There's no star. It isn't one person who's the star. The whole collection of the cast is the star. In the same way, ensemble forecasting is when you make use of many models to reach what we call a consensus forecast. We're not actually trying to figure out what each individual model is saying. We're trying to figure out as a group what are they saying. Um, a typical forecaster might have a, maybe a dozen models to work with, and we have to figure out based on all of these different models well, what's the range of the solutions? What, what What is the coldest model saying? What is the warmest model saying? What is the windiest model saying? What on any given day is the difference? So that we can kind of get, start getting a sense, gee, I don't know, let's say I have a dozen models to work with and eight of them are saying this is going to happen and the other four are saying something almost the same but a little bit different is happening. We kind of build a consensus here. Um, there's lots of different ways that we can kind of visualize uh, how a how a, uh, um, a con ensemble modeling works, but actually what's kind of cool is what we call spaghetti diagrams, and I'll just show you an example of them here. Um, here's a, uh, a map that has two contour lines drawn on it. 
Um, these are uh, two contour lines at 500 millibars of height. It's related to pressure at the surface, but it's not exactly the same. And it's a little hard to see on there, but about the, the, that same contour line is actually drawn on there in about, oh, I don't know, maybe 12 different colors, um, where like 12 different models are showing where they think that contour line is. Now, they're all pretty damn similar. I mean, if you take, if you look at the blue, uh, go on blue line and get the PowerPoint, you'll see, oh, there's a slight difference from one model to another. Um, on the other hand, this is a very short fringe forecast. I think, that, I think if I remember right from when I uh, uh, downloaded this, this is like a three-hour forecast or something like that. All the models have very similar ideas about where each of those contours are going to be. So we have pretty good confidence that this is what the f pressure pattern is going to look like in three hours. Now, in this particular case, I then advanced it, took the model output for uh, a later period of time. This is, let's see, this is a, uh, it looks like it's an eight-day forecast. So eight days in the future from when that forecast was run, this is where those 12 different models or 20 different models or whatever it is, where each of them thinks that contour line is going to be. Now, you can see that the 12 different, you can see what they call these things spaghetti diagrams, right? Because it's a big tangled mess here in the sense that all of these different models have slightly different, in some ways very different, ideas as to where those two contour lines are going to be eight days into the future. Now, despite the fact that all the models have some differences, well, there's actually some ways in which they're all very similar. Notice how all the models have, for example, something like a, like a trough in the eastern half of the United States, and all of them have something like a ridge in the western half of the United States. Yes, exactly where the contour line is is different from one model to the next. But actually, there's pretty good consensus that there is going to be a trough in the eastern half of the United States and a ridge in the western half of the United States. And considering we're talking eight days in the future, that's pretty good. Sometimes the models do not agree as well as this. Sometimes they agree more. Uh, sometimes maybe almost all the models are agreeing on something and then one or two of the models are saying something very different. Well, then the meteorologist needs to go back and look and say, hey, why is there a difference here? Why are some of the models saying something slightly different? And they need to keep in mind because it could be that those models were doing something right. Maybe they were assimilating certain observations that the other models were throwing out. Maybe they made assumptions about the resolution or whatever that turned out to be uh, better than the other models. I mean, we have to keep in mind that no one model is the right answer. It's that they have to come up with a consensus. What overall are the models telling us of what the forecast is? And that's pretty much what a modern meteorologist has to do. There's no shortage of these computer forecasts, and the computer forecasts are in general better than what a human can come up with. But what a human has to come up with is to look at all the models and figure out overall what are they telling us about what the near-term future is going to be like. There's actually lots of different techniques for doing such a things, but that's not where we're going with this in this class. Okay, so that's kind of just a little half-hour overview of how forecasting works in meteorology. Uh, if you have any questions, please let me know. This has been Dr. John Schrage.